Assalamualaikum. Welcome dear brothers and sisters to today's webinar entitled The Heart of the Home, uh, the Rights and Responsibilities of the Wife with our guest speaker today, Sheikh Musleh Khan, in conjunction with Pure Matrimony, which is the world's largest matrimonial site for practicing Muslims. I'm Arfa Sarah Iqbal and I'm the marketing manager here at Pure Matrimony and inshallah I will be hosting today's call. Uh, today's call. Alhamdulillah, we're delighted and honored to have Sheikh Musleh Khan here today. Um, Sheikh Musleh Khan was born in the land of the Prophet in Medina, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Sheikh Musleh grew up in Toronto, Canada, where he developed a strong love for pas basketball and was chosen as part of the starting line. Um, up to five years in high school, he graduated as student president in 1998 and went on to pursue a diploma in computer programming um, at York University, which subsequently led to acceptance at the University of Medina in 2002 to 2011. He has spent, mashallah, approximately 10 years studying under various scholars and acquired a broad understanding of Islamic sciences, including fiqh, hadith, tafsir, and aqidah. Sheikh Musli is committed to spreading a message of simplicity and spiritual fulfillment by empowering Muslims with the knowledge and etiquettes in order to help them integrate into the broader community. He travels to many parts of the world, including Australia, Europe, and North America, to deliver lectures on Islam and Islamic uh, principles to a variety of audiences. In addition to this, he has also appeared on worldwide Islamic TV networks, including Islam Channel and Ramadan TV. Sheikh Musleh is currently the Director of Education at the Khalid bin Walid Mosque at Toronto, where he conducts regular classes and lectures. He enjoys sports such as long distance running and basketball and loves reading and writing. Sheikh Musleh is, a, is very much a family man and enjoys spending time with his family in Toronto, where he and his wife and his uh, young child reside. Uh, mashallah, so welcome uh, Sheikh Musleh. Without further ado, I am going to, inshallah, I'm going to pass you over. Okay, Ask thank you very much, Sister Arfa. Wa alaykum salam. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ba'd. To all of those listening, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I hope that all of you are doing very well wherever you are, wherever you might be in the entire world. I hope that Allah is keeping you all safe and sound and putting barakah and blessing in your marriages wherever you are. And even all of the single brothers and sisters who are listening to this, may Allah Azza wa Jal, honestly, sincerely, I'm praying, may Allah Azza wa Jal give you a righteous spouse, inshaAllah. As you guys see in front of your screens, inshaAllah, today we're going to be looking at the heart of the home. The rights and the responsibilities of the wife, and that's exactly what she is. We're setting the tone immediately that uh, the wife, she is the heart of the home. Without her, the entire home will crumble. Without her, without her there's no sense of pleasantness and warmth in the home without that wife. And this is what we're going to look at tonight, inshallah. We want, we're going to try to focus on a few of her responsibilities, or actually as much of them as we can, and her role as a wife, and how she becomes the heart of the home, inshallah, in her marriage. Brothers and sisters, just keep in mind that, uh, as you can see here, that the religion, of course, places great responsibilities on men and women to complete half of their deen. And most of the Muslims know this, but don't know what the rights of responsibilities are of each spouse. This is absolutely crucial. And that's one of the reasons and the wisdoms why we're discussing this topic this evening. And that is, many people, they get married. And uh, getting married is all the easy part. Finding the spouse, that's, that's all the easy stuff. It's actually when you do get married is where all the complicated issues begin. Just think about a person who's memorized Qur'an. Memorizing Qur'an is easy. But once you finish memorizing Qur'an, then the question is how do you retain and keep the Qur'an with you without losing it? So that's pretty much a similar situation here when you have uh, two individuals getting married. How to maintain that happiness. So that's what, inshallah, what we're going to be looking at this evening. So let's take a look at the duties of the wife in terms of her role with her husband and her responsibilities. 
The duties of the wife, as it's mentioned here, the wife's duties towards her husband may be greater than the husband's duties towards his wife. And this is based on a verse here in Surah Al-Baqarah that Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, and they, the women, have rights. This is extremely important. You notice that the first part of the verse, Allah Azza wa Jal already mentions the rights of the woman. So they, the women, they have rights over the husbands as regards to living expenses similar to those of the husbands over them. So each of them have their own rights and responsibilities with uh, each other. Now here, immediately what this tells all of us here is that Allah Azza wa Jal gives us these rights. It's not something that you and I, we decide to make up. It's not something that our cultures and our backgrounds decide for us. Clearly this verse tells us that Allah Himself is the one that gives us these rights. So this here solves one crucial problem that happens in so many marriages around the world. And that is, husbands or wives, they come up with all of these mumbo-jumbo rights for each other. Throwing it at each other, you know, you need to clean my shoes every single day. Uh, I should never bend down on tie my laces, you should be the one doing that. Each and every single day you should be making me dessert at 3 o'clock in the morning or something like that. So we come up with all these absurd different responsibilities and duties and emphasize them as though it's a huge role, as though it's a right that you have over your spouse. Moving forward, uh, the next part here we will look now, now we're going to actually get into the crooks of the discussion, so the real heart of the discussion. So we're going to jump right into it inshallah in terms of the duties of the wife. Take a look at the first one, obedience. The wife should be obedient to her husband at all times as he uh, is her protector and maintainer and supports her financially. So here she should be obedient to them. We're going to talk about this word in a moment. Women should not see this as a chore, but rather as a means of getting reward. Based on a hadith the Prophet ﷺ mentions here, have I not told you about the women or your women in Jannah? The loving fertile one, if she gets angry, was mistreated or her husband was angry, she said, here is my hand in yours. I will not sleep until you are pleased with me. What this means here, and it mentions at the last point, keep in mind there is no obedience for the husband in the disobedience of Allah. Now let's just take a look at this a bit further. The first thing that you want to focus on is the word obedience. We live in a time, brothers and sisters, that this particular word, obedience, has a negative stigma that's attached to it. As soon as you hear the word obedience, you're thinking like, oh my God, this is going to be dictatorship for the rest of my life. I'm going to be controlled and handled and I don't have, ever have a say in anything that happens anymore. No. Let's look at it from an Islamic perspective. Obedience is a good word. Obedience is a good Islamic word that has a positive meaning behind it. And nobody can illustrate obedience better than the heart of the home or the wife. Why? Because basically Allah Azza wa Jalla has called the man Qawwam or called the man Qawwam. This qawwam literally means that it's his job and his responsibility to provide what he feels is best for him and his family. When we say provide, it literally means that he basically fulfills all of the fundamental needs for himself and his family to live a healthy, normal way of life. The women, part of your responsibility is that you should respect and honor that. What we mean here is that if the husband does feel that certain amounts of money should be here and there, certain things should be done, and it's for the betterment of the home, it's for the betterment of the lifestyle of the home, then this is something that Allah Azza wa Jal Himself gives to the man. Why? Because Allah calls him Qawwam. Now remember, this doesn't make him better than everyone else. No, we're not saying that. What we are saying is that this is his role and his responsibility. It's different for a woman. See, once you categorize things and you put things in their rightful places, then everything makes sense. Allah Azza wa Jal created us all as equal human beings, but with different roles and different responsibilities. So here, the role and the primary role and responsibility of the wife is that you try to honor and respect that as much as possible. And just keep in mind that last bullet at the bottom of your screen. There is no obedience for the husband in the disobedience of Allah. So if your husband tells you, look, I don't like you when you wear your hijab. I kind of prefer when you have your hair down. This obviously is a problem and you are not compelled or required to obey your husband in this particular case. But if he says to you, look, 
your jeans are a, li are, are a little tight, maybe you want to cover them, put something over it or wear a skirt or something else, then obviously this is a reason that not only should you obey him, but more so you should fear Allah Azza wa Jal and maintain your modesty that Allah requires from you. So obedience is the first key and primary right or duty of the wife uh, in and of herself towards her husband. As we move forward, the next uh, point that we want to look at is number two, a halal relationship with her husband. Now let's take a look at the points here. The wife should make herself available to her husband after marriage has taken place and he has given the mahar. This here, this first point, eradicates a very common cultural practice that many of us here, I'm sure we've heard of, called rukhsati. Rukhsati is basically, um, I've just learned this actually not too long ago, uh, basically these two individuals, they get married and they can't live with each other for a, a certain period of time. So they can't have any relationship with each other. This loses the beauty of the marriage, the essence of the marriage, the love of the marriage between each other, especially for the man. The man really does want to be with his wife he wants to be with her intimately, socially, emotionally, all of those needs, then she's required to be there as well. And same vice versa as well. If, if she needs him, then he's also required to fulfill those needs as well. What's the condition, especially when the mahar has been given to her? And we're going to talk about the mahar as we continue, inshallah. Second bullet mentions here, that she should not withhold this right from her husband without a valid excuse, meaning sickness or obligatory fasting, etc. So here, there's a very classic example during the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he mentions about his daughter Fatima. Fatima was married to Ali, Ali radiallahu an. So Ali, of course, is the son-in-law of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even orders her that even if you were needing the flower, and your, your husband calls for you, then you should respond to that call. You should respond. If he wants to be with you, then you should try to do that. Even some scholars uh, have went as far as saying that even if it doesn't feel right or you're just not into that emotional relationship, you know, it's not the right moment, you're not feeling it at that particular time, still try to make it happen. Still try to force yourself even if you have to do that. Why? Because this is crucial. And even scientists, even doctors, even psychologists, all of them have proven that this here, that intimacy between your spouse is a crucial, crucial ingredient for a successful marriage. Sometimes you're not going to feel it the way you usually do, but other days it may feel great. The point is, is that you always want to preserve that intimacy with each other. Why do I even mention all of this uh, in this particular manner? Because brothers and sisters, especially the sisters, I want you to know is that intimacy is a part of our religion. Intimacy is an act of worship with Allah Azza wa Jal. When you are intimate with your spouse, you are worshiping Allah at the same time. And this is something that we're very proud of. Why? Because a companion once asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, that if a person uh, is good, uh, and has halal intimacy with their spouse, will they be rewarded for it? So the Prophet, peace be upon him, responded by asking another question to this companion and said, and said to him that if two people commit adultery, wouldn't they get sinned in the sight of Allah? So the companion responded and said, yes, absolutely. So this is where the Prophet, peace be upon him, said then the same is vice versa. If two people are halal for each other and they're intimate with each other, then Allah will reward them as a result. So imagine, you get rewarded for this, and this is something that we don't have any uh, shyness about. This is something that we're proud of in terms of what Allah Azza wa Jal, how He blesses a uh, relationship. The second bullet it mentions here, she should not withhold this right from her husband without a valid excuse. Third bullet, if she refuses without a valid reason, then she has committed a major sin. And this is unanimous amongst scholars of Islam. This is because one of the wisdoms of marriage is to prevent zina, lose morals by allowing this type of relationship. We need each other to complete one another. That's the bottom line. And especially for a man, the way Allah created him, that many, many times he may need his wife there more than she might need him. 
This is just the nature of men, and this is just the nature that Allah Azzawajal created us with. So sisters, it's part of your act of worship towards Allah that you try to respond to this as best as you can, and uh, as part of your duties as the wife. As we move forward now to the next point. Here the next point, not admitting anyone uh, that the husband dislikes. So here, she should take care not to permit anyone whom her husband dislikes into the marital home. And the Prophet ﷺ mentions here, fear Allah concerning women. You too have rights over them. And they should not allow anyone to sit on your bedding. Not, in other words, not let them in your house, whom you do not like. Their rights upon you are that you should provide them with food and clothing in a fitting manner. And there is also a verse in the Quran, in Surah An-Nisa, that Allah Azza wa Jal talks about this, that the woman, she is hafizat, she is the one that is responsible for protecting the home when her husband is not there. Now this is absolutely crucial. If the husband is uncomfortable with a particular person or individual, then she should try to respect that and try to honor that. And she should try to protect the home from anyone like this. This here also works if it was turned, if it was the other way around. That if the wife would dislike the particular individual from coming in the home, then the husband should also try to honor that as well. The point is, is your home is your home. I don't need to tell you what your home stands for. No matter where you live, no matter what it is that you call home, this is your this is your place of peace. This is your place that you rest. This is the place that Allah gave you and provided you. It's our job to protect our homes. But especially for the man, it's his job to protect the home more than it is for the wife. Remember that word, sisters, that we all hear all the time. Qawwamun. He is responsible for these affairs. So give him that responsibility and respect that responsibility from him. He wants to make sure. And this is obviously not a person who's naive. Not a person who's going to say to you, look, I don't like your mom, so I don't want you to have her here anymore. So, salamu alaikum. You, know? you can't say something like that and he can't use this verse uh, as an evidence to, to justify that. This verse here and also this particular hadith here is referring to somebody that the husband himself knows will cause harm to the home. Knows that he, if this person was in the home, it would cause a problem in their marriage. It would cause a fitna or a trial between him and his wife. And in worst case scenarios, it can even break the home as well, itself. Sometimes it could be an in-law. Most of the times it can be friends and other people, strangers and things like that. So you want to make sure. Now, just to keep in mind, you're not just doing this just to please your husband, sisters. You're also doing this to protect yourself and your home and your honor. You're protecting your modesty. You're protecting who you are as an individual. Why? Because the Prophet, peace be upon him, once said that a person is judged based on the friends that they have around them, based on the people that surround them, based on who you are with. So you want to protect that as well. Whoever you let in your home, you want to make sure that that person also represents a little bit about who you are. Because the Prophet said, as we mentioned, al The person is judged based on the way of life of their friends. And secondly, of course, your home is your home, as we mentioned. It's a place of privacy. Don't just allow any Tom, Joe, Bobby to just walk in there for no reason. You always also want to make sure that a person who's there is not going to give you evil eye, is not going to try to steal your stuff, is not going to try to make fun of how you live and what you do. But they're always going to be respectful of you and your culture and where you come from. So as we continue, next point. Here the next point here in number four, ask her husband permission before leaving the home. Now she should take care to seek permission from her husband before going out of the home that he has provided for her. Now here, uh, let's just take the next uh, bullet really quickly. Women are seen as the guardians of their marital home and their husband's wealth as the Prophet ﷺ mentions here. The woman is the guardian of her husband's house and is responsible for it. This of course means that when he's not there, then she does have to take care of the home and make sure that everything runs uh, well and smoothly and so on. Now look at the first point here. The first point here that we're looking at is that she should seek permission from her husband before leaving her home. 
this here, scholars have explained this point, this here is only referring to things that are not of necessity. So for example, if she needs to go to work, if she needs to go to the doctor, if she needs to go to the hospital or something, then she doesn't always have to seek permission from him every single day, hey look, I need to go to work, it's 9 a.m. And if he says no, then she's just stuck and she can't go to work, no. When it comes to her necessities, these are things that she can do out of her own free will. However, however, keep this in mind, this is extremely important. Even though we mentioned she can do this out of her own free will, what is meant here is that her husband should know, he must know of her whereabouts. He should at least know where he can reach his wife. So if his wife does happen to step out and go to the grocery store or something, he should at least know where she is. Why? Because he is Qawwam, he's responsible for her. If something were to happen to her, and especially for those of us here, I mean Muslim women, you know exactly the trials that you face. Your hijab alone, it, it indicates to you who you are, you're a Muslim, and sometimes you might be in an area where people just don't respect that. So you don't want to become vulnerable to any trouble, and you also, you, uh, as a result, you always want your husband to know where you are, just, just to build that safety um, relationship between each other. So here, when it comes to the necessity, like I said, once you categorize things, then it should make sense, inshallah. Otherwise, you should always let your husband know, and most of the time, at least seek his permission for things that are not really necessary, not really important for you. Now, question here is, what if you really do want to go somewhere and your husband tells you no and doesn't give you the reason why? If he doesn't give you the reason why, then this is obviously a problem because for the women, the wives, you have every right to know why you're being refused or why you've been told no, you can't go to your friend's house or your friend has a get-together and your husband just says no, you can't go, salam alaikum, finish. You have every right to understand or at least know why the reason is. This is part of the etiquettes of the relationship. This is part of the etiquettes of the man. We're going to be talking about this in more detail, inshallah, tomorrow when we discuss the role of the men and the husbands towards their wives. So stay tuned for that as well, inshallah. So, number four, as I mentioned, ask the husband for permission and just keep in brackets there. These are all the uh, non-necessities that you need in your life. As we move forward, when we look at the fifth point, serving her husband. Now serving her husband, she is obliged to serve her husband according to what is reasonable. I like that piece. Keep that piece bolded into your minds. As you look at the screen, that last ending, according to what is reasonable, we're going we're gonna to highlight a few points related to that in a moment. This includes respecting her husband, as the emir and main decision maker of the home. Why, sisters? This is because Allah called him, you all know the word now, Qawwab, the one who's responsible for these decisions. Allah gave him that, so this is why you're respecting those decisions at the end of the day. Keep in mind, for all the brothers and sisters, keep in mind, respecting the husband as the emir and the main decision maker, this is uh, including the fact that he is qualified to make good decisions for the home. So if a husband says, you know, uh, I want to make the decision here that we're going to move and we're going to live as far away from the masjid and the Muslims as far as possible. We want to just be secluded and that, oh, that's it. I don't want to live near them. This is obviously a bad decision. This is an immature decision, especially if you're moving away from a masjid and things like that. You want to be close to the house of Allah to the best of your ability. So you want to make sure that the husband is making good decisions as well. If he's making silly decisions or immature decisions, and trust me, I mean, brothers and sisters, I, mean, I totally get it. As a marriage counselor, I get this all, all, all the time. Uh, walis that are not qualified to be walis, that make bad decisions for their daughters, and then husbands who are supposed to be the amir or the leader of the home, again, make bad decisions for their home, for their families, and things like that. So that's the condition behind it. Otherwise, what you would do is you would seek decision from someone else that is responsible and someone else that's trustworthy, like a local imam or someone else that you trust as well, like the wali and things like that. Respecting the, um, the next point that's mentioned there is maintaining his honor, not speaking ill of him to others, and keeping his secrets and not divulging, the, uh, divulging them. So, I mean, just not talking about his secrets, 
about certain things, if he's got a birthmark somewhere. So even those physical traits about him, these are details that you never ever discuss when it comes to your spouse. This actually work, works both ways as well. Now let's just talk about serving the husband here for just a little bit more. Suppose your husband comes home from work and he wants his meal ready and be placed on the table for him. And this should happen each and every single day. The question here is, is this part of your duties to serve your husband? Do you have to cook for them every single day? Do you have to clean for them? Do you have to iron his shirt? Do you have to put his socks on? Do you have to do this and that? Like, are you responsible for all of those duties as well? Would you believe it or not? Many, many Muslims don't know that scholars actually have a difference of opinion regarding this particular issue. What exactly are her duties towards him? What does she actually have to do for him in terms of her relationship in the home? When it comes to the cooking, um, brothers and sisters, remember that some scholars have said she doesn't have to cook. It's totally her choice. Other scholars have said, no, it's wajib, she's compelled to do this, so it's compulsory upon her. She should cook and take care of him. But Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, one of the great classical scholars, mentions a very, very beautiful um, and, uh, way to look at this particular issue. And he mentions that her responsibilities should be determined by women like her from the society and culture where she comes from. So wherever you do come from, whatever women at your age and your status, whatever their responsibilities are towards their husbands, that should be the criteria that you follow in terms of your responsibility towards him. I think this is one of the most beautiful and logical ways, and it's probably one of the best answers I've ever found regarding how to address this particular issue. So it's not a yes or no, but at least it all depends on who she is and where she comes from. However, keep in mind a second point. If a wife doesn't work and she's home all the time and the husband comes home after a long day, but women like her, they usually don't do much for their husbands, but she's home all day, she's just sitting there, she probably watched some TV or whatever, she woke up like at 3 p.m. and she's just sitting there. And he comes home, there's no food, there's nothing for him. This there, of course, she's got to use her judgment. She's got to be a little bit considerate of him and she should try to prepare something for him in terms of his needs and his foods and things like that. She should try to assist him in terms of washing his clothes and whatever other responsibilities he can. However, does the husband have to do this for her as well whenever he does get some time to do that? Stay tuned because that's what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. If you want your husband to iron your hijab or to iron your abaya or take it to the laundry or if, it's, if your guys are all both sitting at home for like two or three days and you want your husband to go and cook some fried rice or something, are you allowed to tell your husband to do this? If your husband rips his shirt should he stitch that shirt or should you do that? If the baby is crying and needs his diaper changed, who's supposed to be there? Should you change the diaper or can you tell your husband, look, I'm a little bit busy right now, can you go change the diaper? All of these things I'm going to be talking about tomorrow, inshallah. And as I mentioned to you, all of you, if you are looking at this and you're listening to it, this, they go, go, both of these webinars go hand in hand. You need both of them to complete each other. So stay tuned for that. As we move forward to the next slide, um, it continues here with point number five as well. Serving the husband, treating him in a good manner with love and kindness. This is based on the narration Mu'adh ibn Jabal uh, mentions that if a woman harms her husband in this life, the maidens will say, do not harm him. May Allah, may Allah uh, harm you. He is only a guest with you and soon he will uh, leave your company. So here basically serving the husband or part of it and treating him with good manners, with love and kindness. This is some of the standard fundamental things that you need in that relationship. Speak nicely to each other. It is very, very frowned upon in the Sharia for a woman to raise her voice to anybody, especially her husband. And same goes vice versa. Is a man allowed to raise his voice towards the woman? Is he allowed to do this under any circumstance? I'm going to talk to uh, talk to you about this tomorrow, man. You guys got to you guys got to appreciate this marketing for tomorrow's webinar, 
anyhow, so what you'll, need, what you'll need to always make sure is be good to each other, especially the wives towards the husband. Now, just one crucial point here before we go on to the next um, slide. Treating your husband with good manners, with love and kindness, this is actually a benefit for him more than it is a benefit for you in terms of the happiness in that relationship. You might be doing the work, but the fact that you're doing that work, you yourself, meaning the wives, it's because of this kindness that you show could determine where the entire relationship goes and how it moves forward. Let me give you an example. We as men, we need our wives as part of our comfort in our daily lives. We need you to be there. And quite honestly, if we don't see or feel that nurtureness, that tenderness, that softness that a woman naturally has in her personality, our whole day is ruined. Any guy who doesn't admit this is really not being honest with himself, honestly speaking. We need that. Like, I mean, honestly, when you come home from work and a brother comes home from work and he had a real long stress day, the last thing that he wants is his wife asking him, where have you been? Why would you take so long? I checked Google Map. You should have been here like three minutes ago, but you're still not. You're four minutes late. You know, where, where, what are you doing? They don't need that. What, what they would love to have had was, you know, mashallah, assalamu alaikum, welcome home. Well, you guys know, say welcome home. It's going to just feel kind of weird, right? But you're going to say, you know, it's going to feel like a very nice welcoming environment. You're going to walk in there. You're going to see your wife. You're going to be happy. You've missed her all day. You can't wait to just be with her, sit down, have a meal, whatever, watch some TV or something, play with the children. That's the kind of uh, environment that a woman can control. If the woman decides to be the complete opposite, then it just destroys the man and his mood for the entire day. So sisters, I hope you know how much control you really have over the emotions of that man and how he feels about himself and how he feels about his day. That's why you guys all know the saying, behind every great, strong, powerful man, there is a powerful woman. There is a great woman there. They go hand in hand. A man, for him to be great, he needs a great woman behind him. And so the same phrase is understood in its opposite. For a man to be absolutely miserable, he has to have a companion that, uh, that's pretty much the same way with him. So just keep that in mind. Let's move on to the next slide. As we look to the next slide here, we're still at uh, serving the husband, some of the other things that we want to look for. Beautifying herself for her husband though the same time is also expected of the husband as well. Ibn Abbas, listen to this statement. This statement is absolutely beautiful. I love to beautify myself for my wife as I love her to beautify herself for me. To, deny, uh, to not deny him the right to children. Let's take these bullets one, one at a time. Beautifying herself for her husband, she gets rewarded for this. Wives, sisters, you get rewarded for just looking beautiful, especially towards your husband. However, husbands, you also get rewarded for just looking like that handsome hunk in front of your wives. This is part of the enjoyment and love that two individuals should have for each other in the marriage. These are some of the simple little things that so many marriages are missing. Because you know what happens is that so many marriages the two couples, they get dressed and they look their best when it's time to go out to the mall, when it's time to go to the masjid, when it's time to go out somewhere. The point is, is when they're leaving their home, this is the time where you put on a little bit of makeup. This is the time when he combs his beard, he combs his hair. Um, this is the time he takes a shower or something, right? But it's only when they're going out. But in the home now, it looks like an episode from Shrek or something. Like, I mean, just two, these two individuals that are just sitting there and they're not paying attention to their appearance towards one another. This here, brothers and sisters, even Allah Azza wa Jal here, it is mentioned, there's a narration, the Prophet ﷺ mentions that Allah is beautiful, and He loves things that are beautiful. So beautify yourselves for each other. This is one of the reasons why the Prophet ﷺ mentions the best of you are those who are best to your parents, uh, sorry, best to your families. The point is, is that this statement of the Prophet it's not specifying being best at what. It's not specifying anything. So it's actually endless. So including that, 
the most beautiful beauty in terms of your appearance is the beauty that you illustrate and you show towards your spouse. This is more so for the wives than it is the husbands. Why? Because I'll have, I have to just be completely straightforward. Allah created women beautiful. Allah created them. They have a natural beauty in their physical appearance, in their, uh, in their personality, in their voice. All of these things, Allah gave them that natural beauty in them. So that is why a woman is required as part of her duties towards her husband is to maintain that beauty towards him. This is part of the, the beautiful things of marriage that both of you, you enjoy with one another. As for the man, he has certain elements about his physical nature that creates beauty for a woman. What are they? Guess what my answer is going to be, right? Stay tuned. It's coming up for the webinar tomorrow, inshallah. So, and then the, as you mentioned, as you see there at the last point that's mentioned there, to deny him the right to children, this is obviously something that is denounced in our sharia, ah, in the religion. You never ever try, you always try to avoid, unless it's extreme circumstances, to deny the children towards their father. Remember, without that father, there is no children. And it's part of his duties and his responsibilities to take care of those children. We're going to be talking about how he does that in our webinar tomorrow, inshallah. What are the roles of child custody in terms of his responsibilities towards those children? Does he have to pay all of those expenses? Does he have to just pay a portion? Or is it settled in a court battle or whatever? So all of these issues, inshallah, we will discuss them in greater detail tomorrow. As we move forward. We are getting closer, inshallah, to the end. This is just another subtopic in our presentation. As a wife, what are my rights from my husband? Very, very important question. So let's take the first one. Number one is the mahar. This is her right. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, this particular verse that you're looking at. وَآتُ النِّسَاءَ الصَّدَقَاتِهِنَّ نِحْلَةً So give the women upon marriage their bridal gifts graciously. Nihla actually means graciously by with freedom without any compulsion she shouldn't be forced to accept something that she doesn't want or she doesn't like but look at the verse as it continues but if they give up willingly to you anything of it then take it in satisfaction and ease so this is her right it's 100 percent belongs to her and she should be happy with it no matter what. She should always feel great about her mahar. She's all, she should always feel that this is something, no regrets. You know, she made the right decision and this is something that when she does make that decision, she should also consider the abilities of the man financially or even physically, whatever it is that she requests from him, that he, she, he'll, he'll be able to fulfill it, inshallah. One of the biggest and the silliest mistakes that people make when it comes to the mahar is they, they come out with these like super duper mahars. So in other words, she'll say to him, uh, you can give me uh, $10,000, but you can take your time and pay it to me. So he says, okay, fine, you know, I'm, in, I'm working a minimum, wa minimum wage job, so hopefully I'll pay off that $10,000 within the next five years. So for five years now, this guy is going to go there and he's going to start working to try to pay off his mahar. This is a very, very silly thing to do. It actually goes against the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, Because there's a narration, the Prophet, peace be upon him, once said, the most blessed marriages are the ones that have the simplest mahar. The most blessed marriages are the ones that have the simplest mahar. So sisters, as you make your choice for your mahar, just also keep in mind that even though this is your complete right, just keep in mind of the abilities in terms of your husband and for the whole marriage in and of itself. It is a token of honor and respect for the woman. This is a gift that Allah himself has ordained for you. So it's a gift that you should be proud of and you should enjoy it and you definitely deserve it since Allah Azza wa Jal himself feels that you deserve it. The next, uh, the next point here that we want to look at, allowance and accommodation. The wife has a right to an allowance from her husband even if she is wealthy. The Prophet ﷺ mentions in his khutbah during the farewell pilgrimage, uh, their, their, meaning the women's rights over you, are that you should provide for them a 
class or clothing, uh, uh, wait a minute here, their women's rights over you, that you are, that you should provide them in a reasonable, okay, so this is, I understand, that there's just a, a, a brief typo that's here, but basically what should happen is that um, for the men, they should provide something that's pleasing, something that's reasonable, in order to clothe them, in order to provide for them, in order to make sure that their nourishment is taken care of and all of their fundamental needs are also taken care of as well. It is obligatory for the husband to spend on his wife and provide her with all the basic needs including food, clothing, essentials, sh shelter. And this is of course based on a, hadith, uh, sorry, a verse in Surah Al-Talaq, lodge them, the women, where you dwell according to your means. So that's the condition. You're going to provide all of this allowance to your wife, but it's based on your, need, your means, what you're uh, able to do. Now listen, this here, this is very, very crucial because a lot of marriages don't have this, the allowance and accommodation. Now the accommodation of course is always there, but the allowance is what I'm focused on in particular. If a wife is not working, the man should give her some stipend each and every week or month, whatever they want to do, whatever he's able to do. But they should try to do this as best as they can. Because what this shows here is that the man is not only concerned about the home and his expenses, but he's also concerned about her and her personal expenses as well, her personal needs things that she would like to have for herself, huh? things that just the little things, you know, she'll go to a mall or something, she sees like a nice little bracelet or something that she wants to buy, those personal things that she wants, a man also includes that as part of his responsibility. This is what makes us qawwamun. This is what makes us the responsible ones, is that we cannot, we don't only restrict ourselves to the bare necessities, but we go above and beyond those bare necessities and try to do even more. And this is actually a requirement from us to the wives. The third point that's mentioned here, as we move forward, is, well this is interesting, uh, my wife said I don't listen to her, at least I think that's what she said. Allah has created men different from women. Men are more practical, whereas women are more emotional and need of reassurance. So this is a classic, classic example of you know our different roles towards uh, each other. As we continue, number three, love, kindness, and respect. The husband must be kind to his wife and offer her everything that may make her or uh, pleased with him. Uh, look, look, look at this verse, this important verse, and live with them honorably. The Prophet says, be kind to women. The husband should be patient with his wife, even if she upsets you. In the case of Umar, what's the case of Umar, everyone? Umar was married to a woman by the name of Safiya. Safiya was considered to be a woman that lo would lose her temper Occasionally she would lose her temple to such an extent that she would scream and yell and even at times insult him. But look what Umar did. I mentioned this story a long time ago is that once there was a time when Umar, he was sitting in his home and his wife started screaming at him. She started yelling at him. She started calling him names. And two people that were walking by his house, they overheard. That's how loud she was, that they could actually hear her voice outside the home. So Umar decided to take a break from this and he walks out of the home just to take a breather and just to also give her some time as well. As he did that, he confronted these two men and the two men could not help themselves but they asked Umar, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, O leader of the believers, how could you allow your wife to speak to you that way? You're the leader of this Ummah, how could you allow that? So Umar he knew exactly how to behave with women and what it meant to be kind to them. And he responds to these two men foolishly that, and he says to them, shouldn't I be grateful? She cooks for me, she cleans for me, she nurtures and she, uh, she feeds my children. Shouldn't I be grateful? What did Umar do here? Everybody, Umar, he focused on just the good things about his wife. And that is the crucial way to deal with wives or to deal with your wife, is that you always want to make sure that you try your best to focus on all the good things that she does for you. Remember that women, 
they are the carriers of our children. The women also go through a period during the month, which is also something extremely difficult. And the sisters, them, they know exactly what this is all about. Husbands, we should also understand this about the women as well. This is why we have a specific hadith of the Prophet ﷺ mentioning that we have to try our best to be kind as much as we can towards them. And then secondly, of course, this also leads us to our love and respect and kindness um, in terms of their gentle nature and personality. The husband should be patient with his wife, as we mentioned. The husband should understand the nature of a wife is first and foremost a woman as Allah created her. Be gentle in dealing with the glass bottles. Look at the analogy that Prophet ﷺ used for women, calling them like glass bottles, crystal bottles. Like subhanAllah, if you put too much pressure, if you put too much more than it can handle, what's going to happen to that glass? It's just going to break and fall apart. If you start screaming and yelling and being persistent about certain things about your wife, then all of a sudden what will happen? It'll cause her personality to break. She'll just snap. She'll say, I can't take this anymore. I just want to run away. She goes over to her mom's house. She leaves you for a day. She doesn't cook for you. She doesn't this. She doesn't that. This is why learning the rights and responsibilities was so crucial so that you understand how to deal with these issues when they do come up. Be gentle as best as you can. Now, I'm a human being. Everyone out there is a human being. We all got weaknesses. So there may be times when we do occasionally or once in a while or for some people like all the time, they'll be screaming and yelling at their wives or the wives might be screaming and yelling at the husband. So what do you do in this case here? This is where you follow the, uh, an important principle, a very basic principle, one of the ways that the Sahabas used to repent for mistakes that they would make, and that is with every bad deed, with every mistake that you make, try to do something good. So if you did happen to yell at her, scream at her, insult her, call her names, or you happen to call him names, insult him, you know, throw something at him, whatever, then at least try to follow it up with a good deed. Take, buy her a bouquet of flowers. Cook him his favorite meal. Do something. Be mature. You both are married. And being married is a sign of maturity. And maintaining happiness in a marriage is a definite sign of the highest level of maturity that you should have with each other. As we move on to the next point, the next slide here mentions acquiring knowledge. The husband has a duty to teach his wife her religious affairs, including establishing the prayers. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ mentions here, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ All of you are sh uh, shepherds, and all of you will be asked about your wards. The ruler is a shepherd and shall be asked about his wards. The man is a shepherd of his family and will be asked about his ward. In other words, this is just an analogy to show that we are all responsible for the people that are under our responsibilities. We've got to take care of them. So if we do see a weakness in our spouse, then we should try to strengthen that weakness, especially when it comes to her religious affairs, including establishing prayers. What common mistake that happens in a lot of marriage is that the husband and wife pray separately. So she'll be upstairs, and it's time for like, you know, dhuhr, and she'll just pray. And then he'll be downstairs, and he's missing dhuhr because he's working or he's doing something else. So when, it, when asr time comes, he'll go up to her and he'll ask her like, Hey, look, I totally forgot to pray Dhuhr. Did you pray Dhuhr? And she'll be like, yeah, I prayed Dhuhr on time. And then what happens? He starts, he'll, he'll probably get upset. Why didn't you call me? Why didn't you tell me that you were going to pray? Prayer, brothers and sisters, is a time. Just look at the way we pray. We stand beside each other. We touch one another when we're praying. Our feet touch each other. All of this is an indication that prayer is supposed to bring us closer together, not separate us so that we pray individually all, everywhere in the home. It's actually supposed to bring us clo closer together. And this is why there was a very interesting saying back home that uh, in the West Indies they used to say, a family that prays together is a family that stays together. And I really, truly do believe that. And, uh, you know, for those of you who do pray with your husbands or pray with your wives, you know exactly what that feels like. There's nothing more beautiful than you with the person, the love of your life, worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal who's giving you that life. So you want to try to maintain that as best as you can. And this is the responsibility from him. He needs to make sure that he's in charge of these religious affairs in the home as well. Everybody is praying and praying on time. Analogy, if you love your wives and want to protect them from the heat of the sun by closing the window, do not love them 
would you not then want to protect them from all of the evils? I can't even really see the bottom there. <laughs> But this is also, you also wanted to protect them from all the other evil elements that are around them as well. So this is part of, part of our responsibility. And you also want to protect them from ever enter, entering Allah's punishment and His hellfire. Uh, may Allah protect us from that. As we move forward, the fifth, uh, or the next uh, point, the fifth slide here, which is actually our conclusion. The wife here, now let's just summarize a couple of points that we've been talking about. The wife has many rights over her husband, but she has more responsibilities. See the difference here? The wife has many rights over her husband. She has more responsibilities for him. The most important of her responsibilities is her obedience and willingness to serve her husband. She has more rights with regards to being treated well and being handled with care. When a husband is pleased with his wife and gets his due rights from her, her reward is great insha'Allah. See how they work hand in hand? You fulfill his rights, he in return will do the same for you. And as he fulfills those rights, he will go above and beyond to make sure that those rights are there. Remember, I totally understand, like I said to you, as a marriage counselor, I totally understand that uh, sometimes, or maybe a lot of times in a lot of different cases, the rights or the requests that a husband may want may not be uh, the, the, may not be the best request. It may not be something that's Sharia compliant or an Islamic thing that he's requesting. He's just trying to probably show some dominance or some sort of um, control over the marriage. I totally get it. In those cases here, you're going to have to judge a case, um, a situation case by case. So this is where if you do need help, if you do need somebody to talk to, then by all means, you can drop me a line on my Facebook or something or you know, try to visit your local imam, visit your wali, visit somebody that you trust to help you guide you through that process. But here, brothers and sisters, especially for our uh, brothers and sisters today here joining us, this here is a first introduction to these roles and responsibilities of the heart of the home. And I just want to conclude, inshallah, before I mention to you the next slide, uh, the next slide here, don't forget part two, which is as I mentioned to you, tomorrow inshallah which is where we're going to d discuss the other aspect or the other half which is the rights and responsibilities of the husbands and look at some of the questions that we want you to think about brothers do you know specifically what your rights are to your wife sisters do you know what rights your husband ha has over you and find out inshallah all of this and look at the timings there so just make sure that when you go to purematrimony.com slash webinar just make sure inshallah you look at the locality and the timings in your area so may Allah Azza wa Jal bless you all may Allah Azza wa Jal bless our husbands and our wives and most importantly may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the strength to fulfill our rights for each other this is one of the most crucial problems that we have in marriages today. This is one of the primary, if not the primary reason why marriages are breaking today so quickly, so fast, at such an alarming rate, is just that simply both parties will get married and have absolutely no clue what their responsibilities are for each other. It's just like one, uh, it's just like what Dr. Phil once said, that you need a license to open a hot dog stand, but anybody can just wake up and get married. So having said that, brothers and sisters, may Allah Azza wa Jal bless you all. Please stay tuned, and if you can, inshallah, I really look forward to the Q&A that we're going to have uh, shortly. So having said that, I just want to pass, pass this over to our sister Arafa, who's going to just speak to you just for about a couple of things, inshallah. So stay tuned for the Q&A. Assalamu alaikum wa Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh. Um, alhamdulillah, that was, mashallah, amazing. And certainly, I know everyone has really learned a lot from this. So, Jazakumullah khair and, uh, again for this. Um, just uh, one uh, quick announcement, quickly, before we move into the Q&A. Um, this is to do with our next webinar. Uh, mashallah, our next webinar will actually be with uh, Sheikh... Um, He's Asim Al Hakim. You probably know him from Peace TV and Huda TV. He will, inshallah, be doing our next webinar, which is on marital breakdown, its causes and its cures. Now, this event is actually up on Facebook already. If you go to uh, Pure Matrimony's uh, uh, Facebook page, inshallah, you will actually find this under the event section. 
this webinar will actually take place on Thursday, the 28th of March, inshallah, at 6 o'clock. Um, so that's just a, a quick announcement. Make sure you get in on there. And, you know, un unfortunately, you know, we want to be able to bring you as much information as possible to make your marriage, um, you know, a real success. But we also um, do have to take into account that there are problems that do need addressing. And inshallah, this is exactly what you're going to get with this particular webinar. And whether you're married or whether you're not married, inshallah, I would encourage every single person who is listening in right now um, to absolutely do that. Mm -hmm.